Hello everyone, my name is Julie, I'm from Canada, and I run an astronomy education program called Discover the Universe. Um, I love the night sky and I'd like to show you some um, activities um, that would invite students and teachers to look up. Um, so why did I create um, this resource a few years ago, which I'll show you in a minute? It's because I think the night sky is really beautiful. Um, of course, we don't all get this amazing view of the night sky with thousands of stars. Unfortunately, nowadays, most of us live in cities and we don't see that anymore. But still, there's a lot that can be seen even from a light polluted area. And I think looking up is a great way to reconnect students and teachers uh, with the sky and their environment. Every time you look up, you pay attention to what's around you, what's above you, but also what's around you, uh, the weather, what's around. And, you know, I think there would be a great way to uh, fix the nature deficit that we see in many kids, you know, inviting them to look up and pay attention to the environment and maybe care a little more for our planet as well. So a few years ago, I created this resource called Looking Up. It's an activity guide for teachers. It has eight activities in it. Uh, most of them I didn't necessarily invent. I mean, I'm, I'm always inspired by other groups and what other people do. Um, but I really wanted activities that were used, that would use very basic materials that could be adapted to many levels. So many of them might be more relevant. Like for example, in Canada, many of them are more relevant to grade six. Uh, so kids age 11, 12 or so. But to be honest, I used to teach college astronomy and I use some of these activities at the college level as well, which is more like 17, 18 years old. Um, so it can be adapted. And I wanted to get students to act like scientists. You know, you go outside, you observe and you take notes. And from your observations, from your records, eventually, you, you know, you could model what you saw and explain it and so on. And I wanted activities that could be done in cities and rural areas. Um, so not dependent on the quality of the sky. So you can find this resource on our website, discovertheuniverse.ca. Um, if you go in the resources tab, you'll see it right away. It's the first one there. And it is also available in French. So if you go to the French version of our website and I'll give you the URL at the end, uh, you can find the same resource in French as well. So just to give you some ideas of the activities that are, which are in there, uh, the first activity is quite simple. It's simply in the sky, I can see. And then you can bring your students outside and invite them to draw everything they can see in the sky or could see if it's cloudy or if you're inside. Uh, this is meant mostly for younger kids, but you could maybe do it in class um, discussion with older students. Uh, and you can again invite them to imagine what they could see at night or invite them to observe um, and then discuss the next day and so on and discuss what they see. Uh, the drawing I see here was actually from my daughter and uh, it was done in French and we had observed the Andromeda galaxy the night before, I think. But I don't think all kids would write um, the galaxy here in what they can see at night. But, you know, something simple, but again, inviting people to look up and notice what they can see and pay attention to what they see in the sky. Of course, the moon is the main thing you can observe in the sky, whether you live in a city or in a rural area. And observing the phases of the moon is very interesting. If you can observe a full lunar cycle, it's great. Uh, I didn't invent this. I mean, many, many groups have an observation journal for the moon. Some of them use circles that you draw which part of the moon you see. I personally like to ask people to draw uh, the moon in context with what's in the sky. So let's say it's close to a bright star. They could identify it if it has a halo. So that's why I prefer to have like sort of draw the moon in the sky with a rectangle area for the drawing and just note their observations. And when I did that, actually, I did adapt this to my college students. And, you know, it was really a way for them to observe I would tell them, try to look up as often as you can over the next month and then notice when you see the moon. And some of them were surprised to see the moon in the daytime. They had never paid attention to that. Uh, so my goal is not necessarily for them to know in advance when the moon will be visible. It's for them to look up as often as possible and draw their and note their observations. You can also do some activities if you want to focus only on the evening moon. Uh, you can ask your students to start observing a few days after a new moon and then they'll see a very thin crescent in the western sky. Uh, but then as the days progress, then um, the, 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 quart the, the crescent sorry, will get thicker and also higher up in the sky and towards the south. So again, this is I'm based in Canada, so this is uh, Canadian skies. Uh, it would be different if you're in the southern hemisphere. But, um, you know, this is interesting to see how it changes from night to night. You would need 
a few days that are clear, no clouds to do this, or maybe if even if you skip a night or two, it's not so bad. But it is pretty interesting to ask students. I've done that again with my my kids um, to have them observe from the same location uh, at our house and draw maybe the main trees and references that they could see there and then use the same drawing night after night to put where the moon was. And after a few days, they could easily predict where the moon would be the next day. And then they could come and check the next day if that was the case. You could also observe the moon during the day. Um, so I love to, um, again, bring students, make students aware that the moon is visible during the day. We tend to associate moon with night, but it is there during the day. And a great way to model the moon is to use a ball and hold it under the real moon. And you will see the same phase on the ball as you see on the moon. And I've done that actually with my college students again. And even at that age, many of them were, had sort of a aha moment when they realized, oh, that's how the, we see phases of the moon. It's the moon is always a sphere. It doesn't disappear. Like when we draw the moon like this, we tend to think that the, this part disappears, but of course it's always there and it's simply not lit. Um, so this is a very simple activity to do outside. It takes five minutes, but, um, um, I suggest you try it first because depending on the type of ball, sometimes the contrast is not good enough. Styrofoam balls, which are not great for the environment, unfortunately, but they work very well uh, for this type of activity and hopefully you can reuse them if you buy those. Another thing you can do during the day is to point to the moon and the sun in the sky to discover the angle between the two. So in the drawing here, the little girl is pointing at the quarter moon and the sun. So you have a 90 degree angle. So if you're teaching angles, this could be very interesting. And what I love about this is that this angle then helps you draw the Earth, Moon, Sun system for that day. Um, I find that in astronomy, it's very hard, to very hard to reconcile the view from Earth. So what we see when we look up to the view from space, like sort of this drawing here that we see in many textbooks, for example. And how do we go with what we see in the sky? How does that translate to how the Earth, Moon and the Sun are located relative to one another? Um, so I think using this angle idea really helps because then it's the same angle if you put the the earth in the center and then you can put the moon and the sun at a 90 degree angle in this case. Of course, this is not to scale. It's just to give us an idea. Um, but this is, I really like that uh, personally looking, you know, using the angles to discover the positions of the, the moon around the earth, for example, and draw that. So I think it could be interesting if you did that for a few a few times during a lunar cycle and get students to draw their system and see how the moon moves in the system and so on. So again, by just by looking up, you can get a lot of information from this. Uh, if, you're, if you're talking about the sun, of course, we can see that the sun um, there is, has an apparent motion during this in the sky over the day or seasons. And of course, it's apparent motion because it's really the Earth that's moving. But when we look up, um, for example, in Canada, again, the paths of the sun may be different where you live. Uh, the sun is much higher in the sky in the summer than it is in the winter and it goes much further in the northeast even and the northwest where it rises and sets so some activities you can do with that i'll just cover one um where does the sun set so again you you could have students draw uh, the horizon the western horizon and use the same drawing over a long period and invite them to draw where the sun sets this week or maybe once a week or once every two weeks Again, you don't need to have clear skies every day to do this. You don't need observations every day, but then they will see how the sun appears to move along the Western horizon. Or now that many kids have access to uh, digital cameras, maybe you could invite them to take pictures and combine them to create a bit of video like this, uh, like my colleagues did. This is a camera set up on top of the astronomy building at the University of Toronto. And you can really see how the sun appears to move along the Western horizon. So maybe students would love to create a video like this. And again, it, it's inviting them to go outside and look at the sky and you, with um, maybe equipment they already have. And just to finish, I want to mention other activities which are in the document. Um, I have an introduction to the star finder. This is a simple, you know, learning about the basic stars and constellations and how you can play with it, uh, the star finder to align the date and the time of the year. This one is meant for latitudes uh, for southern Canada, so around 45 to 50 degrees north. Uh, it's good for Europe as well, but then if you're in, um, you know, in southern hemisphere, go find something else online. There are many star finders or star maps available. Um, and again, this one is based on the western constellations. Um, I find that, you know, it would be, it's, it's, um, it's great to 
use other constellations as well and um, other um, co constellations from other cultures. So it would be great to discuss that as well. And the last activity is really not mine. I invite people to go to Globe at Night. I love this project if you don't know about it. Again, I'm not behind this project, but I really like it. It's a way for students to look up, become familiar with a few stars and constellations, depending on the time of the year. You don't need to know the whole sky. So you focus on one and you see how many stars you can see from where you're located um, in that constellation. So that gives you an indication of how much light pollution there is. So there's a lot of discussion that you can bring here um, and um, a lot of knowledge as well in terms of stars, constellations, what magnitude is, talk about light pollution, how does that affect our view of the night sky and so on. So check it out. I think it's a great program. So this is just an overview of some ideas um, to connect uh, students and teachers to the night, to the sky in general, not only the night sky, but the day sky as well. And if you have other questions, don't hesitate to contact me. As I said, our program is bilingual, English and French. So you can see the, the French URL here. And I put in orange my personal information if you want to reach me. Thanks.